We have now released issue three of the New Thinking Aloud magazine. Download it for free at newthinkingaloud.org. New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring psychedelics and psychic ability. My guest is Sean McNamara. He is the author of many books on training psychic functioning, including The Renegade Mystic, as well as books on training telekinesis and blind reading and out-of-body experiences, lucid dreaming, remote viewing, and extrasensory perception. He's also written about UFOs and UAPs and the public reception of those ideas. And we're going to be focusing today on his new book, Dewdrops of Infinity, Psychedelics, Psychic Abilities, UFOs, and the Puharich Project. Welcome, Sean. Thanks, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure to be with you. You have uh, a broad background, which uh, I like. <laughs> <laughs> I have a broad background, too, I think. And and to mix topics like uh, training psychic abilities and working with psychedelics. Let, let's start out a little bit with the, the history of the exploration of psychic functioning and psychedelics, it goes back uh, well over half a century. What comes to mind for me is in places outside of the United States, in South America, Central America, and other places in the world, we know that Native traditions, Aboriginal people have used psychedelics in some cases to expand their mind and to see things that are not normally visible to the human eye. And we could use the term shaman in some cultures. The shaman uses psychedelics to access information. Um, so that's just one example of how this is nothing new for sure. It might seem new now because of the laws opening up in this country for psychedelics. Um, so there's more interest and more information available. But um, it's been around for a very, very long time. Well, amongst researchers in particular, you mentioned uh, Andrea Puharic in the title of your book. He's a, a well-known uh, neurosurgeon who worked at uh, New York University, uh, well-known in the field of parapsychology, but he also has a long history in the field of psychedelic research. Yeah, and I, it's a part of his work that I wasn't aware of until recently. It's what kicked off this research that I did. Because I'd read his other books. I'd read his biography of Uri Geller, which was wonderful. And I read his book, Beyond Telepathy. And that book, I used the information there to help with some remote viewing research I had done back in 2019 and 2020 to how, how we can stimulate the nervous system to make us more receptive. And I knew he had a book called The Sacred Mushroom, but I ignored it at the time. I just didn't have any interest in mushrooms or psychedelics at all. But then somehow I came across a video online, and it was a replay of an old show from the 1960s called One Step Beyond. And in that video, it's sort of a documentary. It's a brief documentary talking where the cameraman followed him to Mexico, where he was in search of the psilocybin mushroom. And he meets with a local group of people there and finally meets someone who's willing to introduce him to the mushroom because it was a highly regarded secret. And so the first part of the doc documentary talks about his trip there to Mexico. The second half shows him back in his home in California with the show host of One Step Beyond, John Newland, who becomes his subject. He f gives John several dried mushrooms and puts him through a battery of ESP tests. And he had already tested him without the mushroom. But then to see how he performs under the influence, I thought, this is really exciting. This is very interesting. And I was kicking myself for not finding it sooner. 
It inspired me to go back and read his book, The Sacred Mushroom, which talks about his discovering um, Amanita muscaria in, I think it was in, on the East Coast. In Maine. In Maine. And the experiments he did with a couple of very psychic people there using Amanita muscaria. So, finding the video, watching someone performing ESP tests under the influence, and knowing that someone like Andrea Puharic had already done some of this work, really got my wheels turning. And I thought, maybe, maybe this is something I could do. And by then, some psychedelics were already decriminalized in Denver, and of course now throughout Colorado, uh, they're legal. Or many of them are, not all of them. But at the time, I thought I'd be willing to take a risk and do some sort of a study applying what we know now about psychic functioning, because since the 60s and 70s, the public has become more informed about things like remote viewing. The education that has come out of the remote viewing program for the public has improved tremendously. People understand what psychic functioning is, what its limits are, how to apply it, and that's something that wasn't widely available back in the 60s or 70s. But knowing what we know now, I thought, what kind of study could we do today with psychedelics to test ESP? Well, that program, One Step Beyond, is quite interesting because, if I recall correctly, Puharich did the before and after tests that appear to be not super well controlled, but they look like legitimate ESP tests Mm -hmm. with uh, the host, John Newland. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, there's definitely an improvement here. The psilocybin seemed to show an improvement in his uh, ability to perform a clairvoyance test. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a matter of fact, that seemed to be one of the strongest pieces of evidence in favor of psychedelics promoting clairvoyance that I'd ever seen. Although, as I remember from watching that particular video, which is available on the internet for people who search it out, mm-hmm. One Step Beyond with Andrea Puharic, uh, and the search for the sacred mushrooms or something of that sort. Mm-hmm. They went to a village in Mexico, and and they're with the shaman. Mm -hmm. And the shaman is now, I believe, imbibing or smoking some sort of a a psychedelic concoction and providing readings on a group of researchers, one of whom, as I remember, was Barbara Brown, a well-known neuroscientist, uh, if I remember rightly, uh, who had a long career at UCLA and wrote the book later, much after the TV show called Supermind. Mm -hmm. And uh, some other well-known researchers accompanied Puharic on the trip. And this Mexican shaman is performing all sorts of psychic tasks, reading the body, the physical condition of Barbara Brown. And if I remember rightly, finding a law, an animal that had been stolen. That's right. <laughs> So, now, we don't know that the shaman had these abilities without the, uh, the, the use of the mushroom. But then later on, Puharic. So, if you watched that particular old TV show from 1960s, you'd say on the face of it, this is evidence for uh, the notion that psilocybin enhances psychic functioning. Mm-hmm. And, and there's huge folklore to that very effect. If, if I remember correctly, the first anthropologists or uh, researchers, actually, chemists, I think, who isolated the psychedelic compound harmaline, originally gave it the name telepathine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the science for a long time has known about this to some degree. And I think the question is, how how much have they been willing to accept it, to look into it, to give it credence? Because there's always the cultural blockage, yeah. you know, the cultural baggage involved. So it, people like Andrea Puharch are so inspirational to me because they were willing to cut through all that and and explore, yeah. even though it was rejected by so many people in the population. So, Well, a- another issue, I think, in the popular mind is when we talk about psychic abilities, what do we really mean by that? It, it, parapsychologists have tests, extrasensory perception, card guessing kinds of tests, or drawing 
uh, targets or, or that are remote or th that a person in another room might be concentrating on. But other people would say, no, psychic abilities is seeing spirits or having an altered state of consciousness or communing with God. I think parapsychologists would say, all oh, that's very interesting, but it's not what we mean by psychic functioning. Right. It's such a, there's a broad spectrum of what we could call psychic functioning. And I like the stuff that's testable, where in remote viewing, they call it getting feedback, where you finally see the target you were trying to perceive to make sure we're not fooling ourselves and also to learn from. When we see the target that we're trying to perceive psychically, we can compare them and see where our strengths and weaknesses lay and what we need to work on to improve the ability versus other types of perception where there is no feedback. I often like to share a story of many years ago, I was living with a woman and uh, she had a cat named Juniper. We loved Juniper very much. And one winter, Juniper disappeared in the winter of Colorado. And we had a, I had a psychic reading from a, a pet psychic and I asked him, please let us know what happened to Juniper. And he responded a few days later with a long email saying, oh, I, I see Jaws, and I think it's a coyote, and Juniper, I see her moving to the other side, so she's no longer with us. So my girlfriend at the time and I grieved the death of our cat. And for anyone who loves their animal, you know, sometimes the loss of an animal is as painful as the loss of a person. So we grieved, we're very sad. And later, months later, that spring, one day, Juniper appears, skinny, ragged. She had just run away, but she was fine, and she came home. And there was the feedback that his reading was a complete miss, and it was so upsetting because we've gone through the grieving process. Mm -hmm. So there was the feedback um, that... Controlled ESP tests are valuable because they do offer that immediate feedback, not only for verification, but for learning purposes, that this is a trainable ability, mostly about boosting people's confidence that this is real, that it's inherent in them, and that with practice, they can get a little bit better. And it's one of the big differences between uh, scientific parapsychology and popular psychic functioning because uh, there are a lot of people out there who purport to be psychics, which means that if you, they'll charge you by the hour, mm -hmm. typically, and, and you naturally, you're paying by the hour, you expect results <laughs> each and every time. Whereas in the laboratory, we know that this is a, a real phenomenon, mm -hmm. but it's, um, well, scientists would say it's of a stochastic nature. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's probabilistic. It, it's like uh, a baseball player going to bat. You, you know, I, lo I love the comparison with Babe Ruth, one of the, <laughs> the greatest baseball players in history, um, hit more home runs in his day than any other player, but he struck out far more often yeah. than he hit home runs. Yeah. And the, there's something about that that's, so appropriate for psychic experiments that you have to be willing to try, willing to take that swing over and over and over again and not let yourself become defeated after having a string of misses. Because when the hits come, they're undeniable, they're inspirational, they're amazing. But you have to be willing to take that risk and, you know, surrender the ego a little bit not and be willing to appear wrong. Yeah. You know, all, all of these issues come up. So it's, it's psychological as much as it is parapsychological or as much as it is psychic. It's about the emotions and the sense of self. All of this is on the table when someone is testing themselves or others for psychic functioning. And, and so that our viewers understand your background, you've spent many, many years training people to cultivate these abilities. I have at this point. It seems sometimes like only yesterday when I started, and sometimes it feels like a very long time ago. But when I got started with this, I trained myself to have out-of-body experiences because I was driven by this question, what happens when we die? Is there something more to us in the physical body? And I started with books by William Buhlman, who's an out-of-body experience teacher, and other books uh, like Robert Monroe, that William Buhlman's books are more recent, and I think he has a special talent for giving instructions. Mm -hmm. And 
and I read others too. And so I trained myself, had out-of-body experiences. I answered my own question and I thought, I would like to share this experience with others. And that opened the door to me training myself in other psychic abilities. And every time I would learn something, then I would find a way to teach it to others. And I'm just driven by this desire to give people techniques where they don't have to depend on a person. So I'm not needed. It's just the instructions are all that's mm -hmm. needed. And then they can find their own answers and have their own experiences independently and retain their power and maybe find some fulfillment in their life or answer those mysterious questions they might be holding or heal from, from loss in the past and that question of, is there more to all this? Well, one of your real talents, and it's expressed in practically a dozen books, is, is the art of creating step-by-step -step instructions. It, it's sad to say, but the reason why I write that way is because I am the slowest learner. <laughs> I am the, the, I think the term is the worst horse. <laughs> <laughs> so every time I train myself in one of these abilities, I had to work really, really hard. Some people are lucky. They're just born with natural talent or it takes them very little time and effort and suddenly they can do something psychically or otherwise. But for me, everything I've learned to do, I had to work really, really hard. And a lot of it is because I have a fair amount of self-doubt. It's just part of my emotional makeup. It, it's pretty common, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And but instead of letting it stop me, I worked through it over time. But because it took me so long to learn these steps, it helped me concretize the steps and create formulas that I know if this worked for me, it's probably going to work for a lot of people who are trying to do the same thing. I, through my process, I learned all the places in the maze that lead to nowhere mm -hmm. and then the, the routes that actually lead somewhere. Mm -hmm. So when I have written out my instructions, those are the, the pathways that I offer. And, and then of, naturally I don't, mention the ways that don't get you anywhere. <laughs> well, let's talk about psychedelics uh, some more. You live in the state of Colorado, and thank you for making the trip to Albuquerque. I know it was a long drive. A beautiful drive. Yeah. It is. I've, I've made the drive myself. The Rocky Mountains are just awesome. Mm. In Colorado, these days... Um, Marijuana has been, I think Colorado was the first state to uh, decriminalize marijuana. I don't remember, but it was definitely one. one of the early ones for sure. And, and now, if I understand it correctly, psilocybin is also decriminalized? Mm -hmm. The Natural Medicine Act of 2022 mm -hmm. decriminalized it throughout the state along with DMT and I think that it includes LSD. So a handful of psychedelics are legalized for personal use. Yeah. And, and also for the benefit of our viewers, we should say you've just recently completed a, a master's degree program in counseling. Oh, at Regis University. Regis University. And uh, while you were working on a conventional degree in, in, in conventional forms of counseling, dealing with addictions and all the normal problems that a counselor will see, mm -hmm. you were also engaging on the side in your uh, parapsychological investigations. Right. It was like my secret identity. <laughs> so on the outside, I'm training to be a, a therapist and then privately with a my dear group of friends who I've done many experiments with over the years, I did this year-long study called the Buharich Project, so mm -hmm. named after Andre Buharich. And when I thought of the idea of testing psychedelics and psychic abilities together, I thought I would be the only one. But I told one friend about it, and she said, I'm in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to do this with you. And then I thought, well, it would be good to have a control group. And so I invited these other friends who... They were part of my experiments that I cover in my book, Signal and Noise, about remote viewing. And mm -hmm. that year, we predicted the pick three lottery correctly a couple times. So some of those friends from that group, I invited them into the study, this new study, with me. And so I and two of the people in the study became the experimental subjects. We would microdose psychedelics for six months. So we learned a lot from what we 
having a control group with a microdosing, that was very revealing. And then doing the large doses and comparing my performance with large doses with my performance microdosing yeah. was also revealing in its own way. And I suppose to be fair, it's safe to say the control group were people who had already been trained mm -hmm. by you in remote viewing and, and had shown some real skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, I don't, they're talented, but I don't want to say that in a way that makes them seem super psychic. They're talented because they're optimistic, they're fun, they're creative, they're open-minded. We feel very comfortable with each other because we have developed friendships over the years. And I think that's the magic formula for really good psychic performance. Because I believe anyone off the street has some degree of psychic ability in them. But to draw it out, it's really about the setting. Mm -hmm. I mean, they talk about set and setting with psychedelics. So I think it's set and setting, or mindset and the setting with psychic performance. And in our case, um, I think we had that sweet spot because we, I think often the scientific approach can be too dry, especially with psychic abilities. You can, you can kill a psychic ability by being too controlling, by being too, um, lifeless in the lab. It can just kill the spirit of it. But the way I structured this, people could take their tests at home. Some of it was self scored and I would score what couldn't be self scored. Some of it was in a group situation. We did the telepathy tests over Zoom as a group. I'd be the sender. They were the receivers. But in a sense, we were all together. There was a very good community feel to the whole thing. So there was heart in the experiment and fun. And nobody was wearing a white lab coat, you know, and nobody felt this pressure of people with clipboards standing there judging them immediately. So it was looser than that, but still, I believe, very well controlled. I hear from viewers all the time who tell me that uh, they watch this channel, New Thinking Aloud, regularly because it is their social support system. Mm -hmm. There is, in our materialistic culture, uh, a social support system is lacking. One woman wrote to me recently, 85-year-old woman who's been having out-of-body experiences since she was a teenager. And she wrote about how she would tell her parents when she was young, and they said, don't talk about it to anybody. And then she got older and had children, and she'd tell her children, and they would say, don't talk about it to anybody. <laughs> and so it strikes me that when it comes to set and setting, one of the most important things is simply to have a supportive social group around yourself. It's so true. And, and that one's family would shut it down. That's, that really has a strong negative effect or that you can't talk to your friends about it. That has a strong negative effect because we're conditioned as human beings to seek acceptance in our community. If we're rejected and cast out a hundred thousand years ago, that equated to certain death. <laughs> so we all seek acceptance by our social group. And so we have the option of either finding a different social group that accepts us or putting a lid on it and not telling people about these extraordinary experiences that we have, which can be a painful denial of self, of, yeah. of my personal truth. I'm being rejected. I'm being ostracized while I remain in my community. So for, for the person you just mentioned that her family, her parents, and now her children are both, you know, rejecting her experience, that, that can be incredibly painful. Yeah. yeah. So we, in our small way on YouTube, provide a little bit of an antidote. It's one of the reasons I put up four to five videos every week to keep reinforcing the messages uh, that th this is a real experience reported by, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 percent of the population. <laughs> and, and yet it's still, after 150 years of solid research, Mm -hmm. it's still a taboo topic. Mm -hmm. It's still taboo. So what you offer with your channel is, a, in a way, a social service. Because when someone has been traumatized or ostracized, one of the most healing things that can happen for them is for someone to say, I believe you. I believe you. Those words have so much impact. Mm -hmm. In a sense, your videos and your channel is a way of telling people, we believe you. Because we've seen it. We've interviewed people who've experienced it. 
And you interview so many scientifically minded people and real researchers who have evidence. So it's not a faith based thing necessarily, but there is scientific evidence that these things are real. It is believable, which can be immensely healing when someone finds your channel. They can watch the videos and say, I'm not crazy. I'm <laughs> not crazy. And for some people, that's really important to have that moment. Yeah. Yeah. For a lot of our viewers, it is. So in your case, you had a control group of people who were already open uh, and doing fairly well in terms of uh, the clairvoyance uh, telepathic testing. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you find that the microdosing of uh, psychedelics helped them in any way? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's the big question that the book tries to answer. And so here's the spoiler alert. There was no significant difference in the performance between the people microdosing and those not microdosing. They all showed significant psychic ability. And I want to make sure that people understand that, that I'm not saying nobody was psychic. Everybody was, whether or not they were microdosing, and microdosing didn't really improve the performance of those people. For me, there was a side effect that I wasn't expecting. About a month, four to six weeks in, one day I woke up and I felt happy in a strange way. And I talked to my wife about it and I asked her, is this this is how I'm feeling. Is this how regular people feel? And she said, I think so. I think that's normal. And I realized that I'd been fairly depressed most of my life and also carrying a burden of anxiety most of my life that had naturally lifted because I'd been microdosing psilocybin, which, of course, anyone doing research online knows that that's a very common effect. And maybe many people do microdose for those specific reasons, to lift depression and anxiety. And some people do it to work with um, addiction, depression, other issues. And I wasn't looking for that. But that was a side effect that, that happened to me, which was wonderful. The, there was a secondary effect to that, though, because before I began my study, at some point, something traumatic had happened to me. And I would sometimes find myself doing an ESP test with my eyes closed or wearing a blindfold. And I'd be in a med meditative, open state, receptive. And instead of seeing anything associated with the target, I would have an intrusive memory of that traumatic event. And I'd try and push it out of my mind and continue with the ESP test. And I would just have a string of misses because this intrusive memory kept coming back, which is common with, with trauma. Mm -hmm. But once I had been microdosing for a few weeks and that depression anxiety had lifted, the intrusive memories also stopped, which helped me perform a little bit better, I believe. Even though on the scores there doesn't seem to be a change, my mind was just more open and the interruptions from the traumatic memory weren't happening anymore. So on one hand, there wasn't an improvement, but there was a, there was a profound psychological improvement for me. I did speak with the two people, the two others who were microdosing, and they said, yeah, I don't think there was really a significant change for me. So it doesn't happen to everyone, but it did happen to me. Now, let's define for our viewers what you mean by microdosing. Yeah, there's uh, different information out there. So I, I think the way it's generally defined and the way I define it is that it's such a small amount, it's a fraction, maybe a tenth to a twentieth of a psychedelic amount. Uh, for example, with psychedelic mushrooms, it could be 0 0.05 grams. If a psychedelic dose would be one full gram. So if, a tiny fraction that when you take it, you do not have a significant shift in your consciousness or your awareness or your ability to move or anything like that. So you might have a slight shift in your mood, maybe a slightly boosted mood, but that's about the limit. Below that, you're microdosing. And it's that idea that the medicine is still having an effect on the brain, a healing effect, a transformative effect. And we know that psilocybin has something to do with the growth of new neuronal pathways in the brain, which can affect healing and the reduction of things like depression and anxiety. So perhaps we take it during the day, and at night we go into deep sleep and the brain grows. But we're not having a psychedelic experience, and we're not 
inebriated. We're not high in any way. Some people say microdosing can be a third of a gram or more, and I think that's really dangerous and inaccurate because depending on the potency of the mushroom powder, a third of a gram could be significantly psychedelic, or it could be nothing if it's a very weak dose. So it's subjective. Every time someone begins to microdose, they have to be very careful, start low, and keep it below that level. Keep it sub-perceptual. Mm -hmm. At least that's the way I, I see it for myself. Of course, I know there's been quite a bit of research in uh, Imperial College in London, at Johns Hopkins University. Now, there's uh, something of a renaissance in research going on right now on psychedelics, and it's not particularly based on microdosing. The microdosing, to my knowledge, is folklore. Like I know in Silicon Valley, many of the uh, engineers are microdosing and, and going to work, and it improves their, uh, they believe, it improves their ability to code uh, software mm -hmm. and, and things like that, to concentrate or to be creative. Absolutely. Uh, the creativity goes up. I was never much of a musical person, but musicality became a part of my life after microdosing. And now I'm playing guitar, I'm playing piano, I'm playing the jaw harp, I'm playing drums. None of this was part of my life before a year ago or so, after I began microdosing. It really felt like a part of my brain that had been shut down all my life opened up, and it was very thirsty for music. And there's something about the vibrational quality to it and the creativity associated with music. So it erupted in me, and it's still very much alive. Although I'm not a talented musician, I'm playing music in one form or another every day because some part of my mind, or my brain, really craves it. It's been opened up. So I can see how people with careers that demand creativity or novel thinking, innovation, forecasting, uh, if those parts of their brain start communicating better, if they open up, whereas the noisy, distracting parts of the brain quiet down, uh, microdosing could be that secret edge for their performance. So, Although uh, my impression is that when it comes to the therapeutic use of psilocybin and other psychedelics uh, for alcohol addiction, even heroin addiction, I think, uh, serious cases of depression, uh, those are full doses. Yeah, a lot of those therapies do happen with full doses where the the client or the patient will be in a treatment room, a treatment facility with a couple of therapists in the room with them. They'll do preparatory work before they take the substance, and then they'll follow up afterward, some after therapy care or after session care. Um, so that's another way to do it. Mm -hmm. Now that's a, a in a clinical setting, people are doing the same work in a spiritual or a shamanic setting. I think there's an in-between, too. Plenty of people throughout history have just done it on their own without any supervision and done just fine. I think because of our the way our culture is in the United States, we tend to formalize things or put things in a box and create regulations and, you know, I, I say red tape in a lot of cases and legislation. And, you know, we're very careful about making sure everyone's okay with it, you know, which I think has a role to play. It, uh, it's not perfect. It's not for everyone. And there, there are always different ways happening, too, that may not be so in the public eye. Well, I understand that Colorado and also Oregon are setting up programs for people to become certified by the state as guides mm -hmm. to take people through the experience. Right, and to have licensed treatment centers. I think there's hope for something concrete to appear in next year, 2024. So, we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. But um, I think there's a lot of potential for healing for people who haven't found relief yet through ordinary or typical types of therapy or counseling or medication. Some people take SSRIs, but they, they report that they feel a, a lack of contact with themselves. Mm -hmm. They've stopped feeling emotions or they just want an alternate solution where they can come back to feeling how they really feel 
And some modern medications take that away, whereas psilocybin can do the opposite. Then you have reports such as came out of Johns Hopkins University where people under psilocybin seem to have full-blown mystical experiences, life-changing mystical experiences. Yes. Listed at the, at the top of their personal list of most important things that have ever happened to me, up there with the birth of my first child, things like that. These kinds of experiences happen. That happened to me when I did my ESP test using LSD. I've been meditating for decades. And what happened, my mystical experience with LSD was far more profound and illuminating than anything I've ever experienced in my life before. And I think I should credit the meditation work that I'd done all those years. It's almost like they took me to the edge and the LSD opened the door and I took a leap and really had a, that profound experience. And I think it's, it's not special to me. It's very common. It's very common. The understanding of the nature of reality, of what is the role of meaning and existence, what is well, there's so many questions we could ask. Let's take a look, for example, at the book, The Psychedelic Experience by Leary, Alpert, and Metzner, mm -hmm. written back in the 1960s. They base that book on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And their insight was that uh, the psychedelics open up uh, visions of the, what the Tibetan Buddhists would call the bardo planes, the after-death planes. Uh, there seems to be an enormous lore to that effect. Yes, and a lot of my training earlier in life was in Tibetan Buddhism, and the experiences I've had with LSD and psilocybin echo that too, that what those teachings say, including the Tibetan Book of the Dead, about the nature of reality and the in-between transitional states of our existence um, those, with LSD and psilocybin, those written teachings become lived experience. I mean, I'd read these books for years, trying to understand them, meditated, tried to experience my awareness in deep sleep, on the edge of falling asleep, in dream. These are some of the bardos. And of course, someday I'll die, and then they're the bardo dying and after death. So that'll happen eventually, but... Being able to experience those realities with hallucinogenics, knowing what these traditions have known forever, and they're trying to communicate in writing or in teachings from living teachers, but to experience it is such a gift because the trick to it all, I shouldn't call it a trick, but one of the messages, how do you hold your awareness when you find yourself in these states? Are you able to be present? Are you able to be balanced and open? Are you able to operate freely of conditioned behaviors, of habitual thinking? Are you able to experience something in a fresh way and just be present, absolutely present in an unconditional way? Can you experience your mind and the mind of reality without freaking out, without reaching for the edge of the swimming pool, without reaching for that, the vine at the end of the river, without seeking security, something like that, which brings us more into the, the physical world again, out of that sacred space. But one thing I realized for myself, with, especially with the LSD experience, was there is no difference between this ordinary experience of being a human being with a physical body and that that other space that we might think of as being more sacred or on the other side or on the other side of the veil, that, that bigger place, that maybe that space of God mind, if we want to use that word. One of the insights I had, which I think is in these teachings, is that there's no difference. And this, this life of birth and death and illness and confusion and struggle and joy and anger and all the emotions is just as sacred as things we typically hold to be more sacred or more valuable. It's just in the ordinary state of mind, I'll speak for myself, I feel I forget that and I stop honoring that. But something about the psychedelic experience shows that this is where it's at. This is where it's most accessible, that we are already 
an inherent sacred part of the universe, that we're not separate from each other or from the ultimate reality, that it's happening all the time. And even as I say that, I, I know I might be sounding foolish or making something up, but it's an insight that comes from that psychedelic experience when the mind is fully open to these realities. And then, of course, it closes down. And it has to. We do have to be closed down in a certain way to put on our pants in the morning, put on our shoes and go driving traffic and go to work and exist and learn through our struggles, our daily struggles. That's where the juice is at. So we, we do have to be shut down because we're in this wide open space. There aren't enough boundaries there for us to have this timeline of experiences. Getting back to ESP <laughs> for a minute. Uh, you talked about the fact that the microdosing showed no difference between your uh, otherwise psychic friends mm -hmm. and uh, who, who could function uh, on tests of telepathy and clairvoyance fairly well with or without mm -hmm. the microdosing. But you also talked about taking some larger doses. Mm -hmm. Did you test yourself uh, with the larger doses? I did. And what I found was that my performance seemed to be, it was still, it was good, but it was consistently good. Whereas with the microdosing periods and the control periods, when I wasn't microdosing, my performance would go up and down. I'd have plenty of misses and some hits, but on the few times that I took large doses, they seemed to be consistently high scoring sessions. Now, speaking scientifically, a handful of tests is not enough to come to any conclusion. I'd have to repeat these tests many times over and over again under similar conditions to really say for sure that the, the substances do improve my performance consistently. So, I don't want to come to that conclusion yet, but it's enough to keep me interested. It could be that I was just highly motivated during that period that I was very interested because this is the first time that I'd done most of these hallucinogenics. The only other time was in college. I did mushrooms and I had no idea what I was doing back then. So I was curious. I was highly motivated. I was doing it as part of a um, my project. So that's part of the motivation. That could have been the cause for the improved performance and not the hallucinogenic. So there's still a lot of open questions. I also found during the tail end of the project and afterward in other experiences that I've had, it, the psychic ability seems to stay strong in days or weeks following taking the substance. And if I were to do this whole study all over again, it would be large doses all the way through, but testing people on their psychic ability in the days or weeks after they take it. Because I think this could have something to do with, um, oh, I'm forgetting the name of, the, there's a period of the brain when it's open to learning. For example, when ducks are born, when they're very young, up to a certain point, their mind can imprint Imprinting. on the adult. Mm -hmm. So, and then it closes down so they don't just imprint on anything. The same thing happens with humans where the mind, there's this period that's, is very open to learning new things, to creativity. And people are starting to inquire, do psychedelics reopen that critical period? That's what it's called, the critical period. Can it reopen it? And I'm wondering if psychedelics actually reopen the critical period in the brain that has to do, or the mind that has to do with psychic receptivity or the ability to send. So that's a whole other way the research could go. It can open critical period for learning new abilities like playing musical instruments, for uh, well, for doing many other mental tasks, it, this, there's this brief opportunity to do things in a new way and go in that direction. So, Well, one of the things that seems certainly true for most people is that when you're high on, on a full dose of a psychedelic, uh, taking an ESP test is probably the last thing you want to do. <laughs> it was. It was terrible. <laughs> I have video footage of myself doing these tests, and you can see the strain on my body and my emotional states, because I did have some extreme states of, I recorded one laughing fit, which lasted about eight minutes, mm. but then some periods where I, I cry, 
Uh, so the, there are the emotional ups and downs, but it really felt sometimes like I was wearing a 80 pound vest. There's that body load mm. sometimes. And just trying to see, trying to sit at a table <laughs> and trying to perceive psychically while these hallucinations are occurring. Of course, that's important because I, wa- I wondered if the psychic, excuse me, if the psychedelic images contained the psychic information. Maybe that would make me more psychic. And I realized, nope. In some cases, there was a little bit of psychic information there. Especially, I did a card test with tarot cards. Sometimes the information would come through in the psychedelic images. But the real value was learning that most of the psychic information didn't come from there. And it forced me to redirect my attention around the psychedelic images to some other place. It's as if I had to look around my brain. So the psychedelic imagery was forming a boundary for me to help me know where to point my attention to receive the psychic information. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's just saying, don't look over here, look over here, which is really, really valuable because I think the same thing happens when people, for instance, do remote viewing. With practice, they learn to discern what is what's called analytical overlay when we're trying to name or put nouns to what we're, you know, we're trying to guess the answer. And that's just all left brain thinking. We would need to stick with the raw information, the irrational stuff. So how to discern one from the other, where to look within ourselves for that raw psychic data. And so the hallucinogenics helped me learn how to use my mind that way. And of course, I realized at the end, there's many ways to do that. You don't have to do hallucinogenics to learn this. Meditation does the very same thing. We sit quietly and watch our minds. And we see so much noise. And when we learn to identify the noise from the signal better, then that's all that's ne- needed. Yeah. Well, it comes down to, uh, I suppose, be, for us to progress, we need to have a good theory of the mind-brain interface. And uh, one theory, of course, that uh, parapsychologists love is William James' notion that the brain isn't the producer of consciousness. It's just the almost the opposite. It's a filter. It reduces consciousness that comes from the realm of consciousness. And uh, if that w- if we were aware of everything all at once, as is reported in the experience known as cosmic consciousness, you can't function (laughs) (laughs) at at all. So the brain protects us from having conscious, cosmic consciousness all the time. Mm -hmm. And and one sees that uh, there's quite a bit of new research now in psychedelics suggesting that in the intense experience of a uh, psilocybin high, for example, the brain is quiet. The reducing valve is uh, opened because the, it's not working. Mm-hmm. And so more of that uh, material from the realm of consciousness comes in. Now, there are other ways of looking at it. There's the idea that maybe there's an organ of psychic awareness somewhere in the brain. Mm-hmm. If we can just identify that organ and activate it, then that would improve psychic functioning. And for all I know, maybe both are true. Right. It could be. I think we're still at the very beginning of researching that and finding it. I know there are many ideas about the pineal gland and the production of DMT in the body already and that certain breathing exercises can perhaps cause the body to squirt out a little more DMT. And does that open the gateway to perceive the vaster reality? So I think there are possibilities there. I do agree with the idea that the brain is a reduction valve And that allows us to have our life journey, to have our individual growth periods, and then what we learn from those lessons. If we weren't, if we didn't have a reduction valve, we'd be all over the place, seeing everything at the same time. Then there's no life journey. I I often think of this episode I saw of the Hollywood medium with Tyler Henry. Is this wonderful medium? Mm -hmm. And I think this is on Amazon Prime or something. But in the very last episode of the series they put on a a headset on him while he did a mediumship reading on on someone and they saw what you just talked about that his brain became very quiet i think it really went deep into delta 
And of course, Tyler Henry is very accurate. And he's a great, great medium. And just to see what happens in his brain. And of course, there's a whole, I think he sweats a lot. There are other physiological things that happen to him. So it's, it's not simple. It's, it's complex, but it's physiological as well as non-physical, that there is the interaction between the physical brain and this larger non-physical mind or consciousness. Now, as part of your journey, you also experimented with DMT, which many people regard as the most powerful of the psychedelic substances, and as you pointed out, one that's naturally produced in not only the human body, but in the body of most uh, animals, and I think many, many plants as well. Yeah, it's everywhere, and what is its purpose? I think I, I haven't looked into really why why is it found everywhere. I really just went into, well, it's legal now in Colorado. How can I get some? I've heard it's really powerful, and I just took a chance. So I um, I learned how to extract it myself from the mimosa hostilis root, which you can order legally, and just using some chemicals over a few days, you can easily produce some crystals. And... Then, with my help's wife, we did a telepathy test, or we, we tried. <laughs> well, so, I'd never done this before, and I knew I might never do it again. So, we planned to do several tests. And we loaded the pipe. So, this is basically vaporizing the crystals with, with heat. I inhaled it, and it's really funny because I... In the video, I'm on the couch, and I'm ready with my clipboard, and she's starting to send a telep telepathy target. And then I just put it down. I'm like, I, honey, I took too much. Because <laughs> that's the thing. You can take a certain amount and still remain conscious. And then if you take a, if you cross that line, you do what's called, you have a, you go into breakthrough. You basically, not collapse, but you lose some motor function. You just want to lay down and you experience yourself being in a completely different environment. I don't think it's the same thing as having an out of body experience. I just think something happens in the brain. And you seem to be somewhere else. And I was only gone for about four or five minutes. It felt like I'd been gone for weeks or longer. And I started to come back um, for a few moments or a minute or so. I was looking at my wife, and I couldn't tell if that was me <laughs> or if that plant was me or where do where does me and everything else and where, where's that boundary? I couldn't find the boundary. Which may be actually an experience of true reality. Right. Absolutely. I mean, going back to the notion of the brain as filter, I remember Jill Bolte Taylor hearing her lecture on, it's titled My Stroke of Insight. So she describes her experience having a stroke yeah. in the same experience. It sounds like she's describing a DMT experience to some degree, not entirely, but that loss of boundary. Mm -hmm. the, there really is no separation between you and me and these beautiful flowers that we're all, there's a sense of oneness there. And the division is artificially produced in the brain. I, well, that's my view of things, ac actually, and it's in accord with the perennial philosophy, the primordial tradition, the mystics of every culture say, we are one with everything. That's if, if we could see reality as it really is, we would know that it's infinite. Mm -hmm. it's and such peace. Place, yeah. 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 So, in any case, there you are on DMT. <laughs> And I'm crashed out on the couch, and my wife is waiting patiently for me to come back, and I come back, and eventually the boundaries return. And then I waited about 20 minutes, and I was completely back to normal, thanking, <laughs> thanking the world that my brain could put, it back, put itself back together into complete normalcy. Yeah. And then we did a telepathy test, and I think it may be the best test that I did during that period of time. And it's important to note that I didn't do it while I was hallucinating on DMT. There's no way I could have done it. At a certain point, I did try during the tail end of my experience, but I realized that there was so much... Um, I was 
all the sensory input was getting confused. Sounds and sights and flavors and synesthesia basically was occurring. So there was a lot of confused experience happening in me. And I realized that if a psychic impression were to come in, it could also be confused. So it was hard to discern anything psychic from whatever else was happening in my mixed up mind. So that's why I waited 20 minutes till I was fully back to myself. But then to have an exquisite telepathy session. I mean, it was extraordinary. It was this, the target was an owl. And my wife had set, chosen her own targets. I had no previous knowledge of the targets she had chosen throughout the study. And the first thing I drew was two circles. And if you take that paper and overlay it with the target, it was almost the same size as one of the eyes of the owl. Mm. And then I drew other shapes that if you combine them, were very similar to the shape of the owl. I mean, the details aren't that important about the target itself, but just that, um, that my mind could be blown into a million pieces during the DMT experience. The, the filter was turned off, the boundaries disappeared, and then it's reconstructed. It's almost like a, a reboot of the brain. And then I can still access psychic information perhaps better than any other time. Mm -hmm. Now, you use the word synesthesia. We've done many programs on the New Thinking Loud channel about synesthesia and its importance in uh, parapsychology. But I know many of our viewers won't understand what the term is. So, could you define it? Sure. It's when the sense perceptions become confused. So, you could see a sound or if you could hear a color, and sometimes these things happen at the same time. And it's for me, it was garbled and muted. It wasn't very obvious. Uh, a smell could have a color to it. Emotions could have color, or a sound could produce certain specific emotions. So the part of the brain that normally puts everything together nice and orderly, that combines all the senses to form a unified experience, Something happens there and the wires get crossed and which I think is also part of that unified experience that they're not separate in the end. It's all, I mean, I don't like using this term very much, but it's all a series of vibrations mm -hmm. to, to some degree. Maybe there's more, something more fundamental than that, but the way it arises, the way it manifests is through these interwoven vibrations creating experience. Well, in summary, Sean, how would you characterize the relationship between psychedelics and psychic ability? They both reveal that reality itself is boundless, is borderless, is unified that we are expressions of it, and at the same time, we can be co-producers of experience. But also, that when we have these limitations, maybe we might feel like we're not psychic at all, that doesn't take away from the value of our ordinary human life. But if we never experience a psychedelic, that's okay, because in a sense, Psychedelia is all around anytime we see a pattern. And I think anyone who's been on a journey will agree to this, that the pattern of flower petals and the beautiful artwork that humans for thousands of years or longer have produced, even like the carpet here, is psychedelic in itself. Something in us is already connected to the psychedelic world, the world of pattern, color, rhythm, and music. It's inherent in us. We are imbued with that beauty, this beautiful artistic nature of, of life itself. It's in us already, and we don't have to take hallucinogenics to experience it. We can pick up a set of color pencils and a piece of paper, and it's in us. We can play some music, and just to enjoy music itself is a psychedelic experience, I think, and a, an experience of unity with reality. But with regard to psychic functioning in particular, the impression I get is that uh, the worldview 
that has opened up the metaphysical view that psychedelics uh, waken in people uh, may be the factor that triggers long-term psychic functioning even after the effects of the drug are, are gone. Absolutely. They could be the, the key that opens the door to eternity, to use the title of <laughs> Andrea Puharch's book, The Sacred Mushroom. Um, they could unlock something, and I think many people throughout history will agree that yes, mm -hmm. these are tools with amazing capacities, and sometimes you only have to do them one or, once or twice, and the door is open. Because I think in general, uh, there's very little actual research. You did this on your own. If, if you had tried to get an institution to sponsor your research, it probably wouldn't have happened because of safety factors yeah. and, and institutional review boards and, and the like. Uh, so, there's been very little research uh, actually testing people while they're under the influence of these drugs. But to my knowledge, like and it's not complete, but my knowledge uh, seems to be that the research overall suggests that these drugs do not enhance psychic ability. But you're giving me a whole new way of thinking about it. I, I'm glad because I think it's a complicated thing. It's not so simple to say yes or no on the matter, but there's so many doorways that we could pass through to inquire about consciousness itself and its relationship to the physical brain and what happens with the inclusion of psychedelics when we open some of these pathways up. So some scientists may say, thanks, Sean, for doing the study. We don't have to do it now. You, you seem to answer this question. It doesn't increase abilities. But I think it does ask a lot of other questions that are worth pursuing over time for anyone who has the means to do it. Mm -hmm. Well, Sean McNamara, uh, it's been a fascinating conversation, very revealing of some of the nuances that get overlooked in the scientific publications of uh, this material. Uh, the conversational format, I think, works excellently for uh, this topic, and I'm delighted that you're here with me in Albuquerque, that we can have a few more conversations before you go. So, thank you so much for being with me. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been great so far. Yeah. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. You are the reason that we are here. I imagine that by now, many of you already realize that, in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? New Thinking Aloud is a non-profit endeavor. Your contributions to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation make a meaningful difference in our ability to produce new videos.